Welcome to the Beast Rider Podcast. I am your host, Ryan Sakamoto, and today we are going to be discussing ESPN Mel Kuyper's mock draft as it pertains to the San Francisco 49ers. So let's get started. Now, before I go ahead and do that, I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you for subscribing to my channel. Just be sure to flip on and turn on the bell notifications so you get notified when I go live or when I upload content. Also, I'm looking at my analytics and I'm noticing about 73% of you are watching and liking all my videos but have yet to subscribe to my channel. So do me a solid please and hit the subscribe button in the lower right hand corner of your screen as you stay up to date on all things Beast in real time. Alright, so without further ado, let's get started as we break down Mel Kuyper's trade proposal as it pertains to the San Francisco 49ers and what they do with the number 12 overall pick. So let's get started. All right. So if you don't have ESPN Insider, don't worry. I got you covered. It was a mock draft that Mel Kuyper had put out. And he has a trace nerd where the San Francisco 49ers strike a deal with the Detroit Lions, move up five spots, and select a quarterback while releasing Jimmy Garoppolo. All right. So I basically just broke down the trade for you. So the 49ers, again, trade up for a potential franchise quarterback, and they release Jimmy Garoppolo as a post-June 1 cut designation, saving the team $25 million in cap savings, as opposed to $23.6 million cap savings that I stated in my earlier podcast, which is a difference of 1.4. Now you're probably asking yourself, why the difference? Well, the designation from June and June 1, cut and a post June one cut is very different but the savings is minimal when it comes to Jimmy Garoppolo's contract and how it's structured so the savings like I said was only 1.4 million dollars so it's not much but it's still something something's better than nothing and here we are today all right so I think it's better to release Jimmy Garoppolo now as opposed to later because when you have guys that are coming up for contract extensions like Trent Williams, Kyle Juszczyk, and Fred Warner, you really have to get the money now so you can kind of extend them. Otherwise, they're going to be more disgruntled or going to be like, what the heck? What's going on, dude? So stuff that I pointed out in earlier podcasts. Again, if you haven't caught my earlier podcast because you're new to subscribing to my channel, please do me a solid and you can watch all those podcasts in my podcast playlist at the end of each episode. You just have to click on the description of each podcast episode that I post and you'll see a podcast playlist and you can see all my thoughts and analysis in real time. Also, I'll include the same podcast playlist at the end of each episode so you can go ahead and click on the box and then check my YouTube Twitter receipts there. All right, so let's go ahead and get back as it pertains to this podcast. What's the value, right? Like, that's the question. Okay, so the San Francisco 49ers trade with the Detroit Lions moving up five spots to get a quarterback, a franchise quarterback. Who's that quarterback? And do they give up the farm? Because obviously to move up five spots to inside the top 10, now you're talking about draft capital, right? So let's go ahead and break it down brick by brick as to what ESPN Mile Kuyper had to say on ESPN. Let me just pull that up. Bear with me for a second. Okay. He says, another trade and this one could cost the 49ers a lot of capital. Here we go. It's tough to project the exact details, but moving up five spots in a talented quarterback class means there will be competition. We can look to the Mitch Trubisky as one trade comp, but other other excuse me, but another could be Steelers move for Devin Bush in 2019, where they jumped 10 spots with the Denver Broncos and had to give up the number 20 and 52 pick plus a third rounder pick the following year. Yes, it's 10 spots, but the Lions should expect a similar return. That would mean they'd get pick number 12, the 49ers second rounder. He ain't listed here, but it's number 43, and a future pick. Though San Francisco doesn't have a third round selection because of its trade for Trent Williams last year. Mortgaging your future. I would be I wouldn't be shocked though if the Fortners had to give up their 2022 first round pick to get it done. Wow. He furthermore said the Fortners would get their quarterback. Detroit is rebuilding and needs premium picks to add talent across its roster, and it already has the Rams first rounders in 2022 and 2023, and their third rounder this year. This is a win-win deal for both sides. Now, as to who that franchise quarterback is at number 7 that the 49ers trade up for and get, that player is none other than Justin Fields. And he says, This is a pick that raises the 49ers ceiling. When they went to the Super Bowl in 2019, they were led by a stellar running game and defense that could both rush the passer and create turnovers. Now that I think about it, if I said number 8 earlier, I meant number 7. You guys got the picture though. 
moving up five spots from 12 to 7. All right. If I say 12 to 8, man, my math is off. But anyways, 12 to 7. We're getting the picture. All right. But moving on, it didn't appear that Coach Kyle Shanahan fully trusted Jimmy Garoppolo to win playoff games with his arm. I love to see Fields play for Shanahan, who could get the best out of him. If this deal happens, San Francisco could designate Garoppolo as a post-G1 release and save $25 million on its cap this year. That will help offset the lost draft picks in the trade because the team would have some money to spend in free agency and bringing back left tackle Trent Williams. The Fires were really hurt by the injuries last year, last excuse me, last season, but they could be back in the NFC West race in 2021. All right, good job, Mel Kiper. Great analysis. So yeah, here we are. That's his analysis, and I'm just going to break it down brick by brick on whether or not it's a realistic move, and. I believe it is. Absolutely, it's a realistic move. Now, the question remains, would I make this move? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You know, while Justin Fields is a good quarterback, there's no guarantee while I believe Zach Wilson to be a better fit for what Kyle Shanahan wants to do in that offense. That's just my opinion. All right. And furthermore, when you mortgage the future, once again, giving up valuable draft capital, it just doesn't make financial sense when you should just stay at Pat, stay at Pat, stay Pat at 12 take the best player available or trade back and just let the draft unfold as it should and then target a player around the 18 to 25 range. Because certainly when you're sitting there at 12, there's no edge rusher worthy of that selection. And based on the needs, there's no offensive lineman worthy of that selection if Rashawn Slater's off the board. We all know Pinay Sewell, if you watch my mock draft, he's going to go in the top five. I have him currently mocked his Cincinnati Bengals at number five. And that's how I see that playing out. But without, with that being said, then you have to look at a trade down because the needs sitting there at 12, you'll be reaching for a player. If there's a team behind you that really wants that player at a position of need that, and that's a need that you really don't need to address because you're really a strong point there. Like, let's say, I don't know what position would we think about? Let's say if if a Micah Parsons falls, right? Somehow falls out of the top 10 and you're looking for a Micah Parsons, right? An outside linebacker, inside linebacker, whatever the case may be, you would be looking for a linebacker and you can probably strike a deal for someone that wants the best linebacker in the draft. Now, again, all these players can get pushed or pushed back off the board depending on what happens at the top of the draft. Deshaun Watson still wants out of the Houston Texans. That was just reported today. And with that being said, that's going to have an integral role in the top five picks because as we know, the New York Jets hold two first round draft picks, number two and number 23. So if they want to leverage this deal and Salah wants to make a move and a power play move for Deshaun Watson because they have the draft capital to do it and they don't firmly believe in Sam Darnold as being that guy, then go ahead and make that play. On the flip side of that, they can also stay pat, take a guy like Zach Wilson at number two, or they can just keep Sam Darnold and then just roll with the best player available, giving Sam Darnold the offensive weapon that he really hasn't had since coming to New York in the first place. And that could be a Devontae Smith, a Jamar Chase, or someone else. So there's a lot of moving parts, especially when you talk about the first five picks. And I believe a lot of these players are going to either get pushed up or pushed back depending on how the draft position falls and where these trades play out. Okay, but getting back to this specific bot podcast, 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 um, Kuiper said he wouldn't be surprised if the Fortnite gave up two first round draft picks. Like that to me, that's mind boggling. Like, why would you mortgage the future by giving up two first round bat draft picks when you know you have to solidify the offensive line? Like, how can you build the offensive line through the draft if you don't have high round picks to do it? Like, yes. Maybe under the Bob McKittrick days, you can find guys like Eric Heitman, right? In the later rounds out of Stanford. Um, some of these other guys that have been drafted, like David Hofstra, right? Dave Hofstra out of, uh, not David Hofstra, David Fiore out of Hofstra, David Hofstra. David Fiore out of Hofstra, you know? People are probably saying, what the hell's Hofstra? Hofstra is a football program that doesn't even exist anymore, all right? Hofstra is a college that Giovanni Carmazzi came out of when the team should have drafted Tom Brady. Hofstra is the college that the 49ers got in the strong safety, hard-hitting land shoulder. So Hofstra is a good school, man. Dave Fiore was a really good player. If you guys don't know who Dave Fiore is, I strongly encourage you to go back to the season opener. I believe it was 1998 in the game at home against the New York Jets where Garrison Hurst ran for a 98 or 96-yard touchdown run. I believe it was a 96-yard touchdown run. Took it to the house in overtime. One of the greatest plays ever. 
I was there front row and center. It was a really, really memorable play at Candlestick. And Terrell Owens and Dave Fiore led the way for Garrison Hurst to go and make a house call. But getting back to the podcast, let's talk about offensive line. Yeah, no quarterback can have success without a stable offensive line. Games are won down in the trenches and teams should be built from the inside out, not the outside in. Because no quarterback, like I said, can go through his progressions, make the proper reads, have the allocated time to make those reads when those wide receivers are coming out of their breaks or breaking off their stem. And then to further compound that problem when you don't have an offensive line that can't sustain any type of a running game because they can't block up front and defensive linemen are penetrating the backfield left and right. Now you're making the offense one-dimensional, which puts undue pressure on the quarterback by default. So it has a dumb on, uh, a domino, has a domino effect. It has a domino effect of myriad of issues moving forward because again, games are won down in the trenches. If you can't solidify the offensive line, it does not matter who's behind center. We all saw what happened with Pat Mahomes in the Super Bowl. Just saying, right? Just saying. He have both his tackles there. And Pat Mahomes struggled and it showed. All right. How invaluable the offensive line is to any NFL team, not just at the San Francisco 49ers. All right. So you really want to manipulate the draft with those draft capital, um, with the the draft picks that you get for draft capital. Right. Because, again, you want to leverage the salary cap with those highly prized players, because if you can't manipulate the cap by getting guys on rookie deals and producing at a high level on those rookie deals now you have to delve into free agency overpay for some of these free agents because they're going to help reset the market and you have to get a bargain player but just good enough who can kind of replicate what a rookie could do or a second year player can do when that player is actually on a rookie deal and could be actually outperforming that guy he's going to command more money because he has what tenure and if you don't pay them, someone else will. And in the free agent market, that's why the bar keeps on getting reset, reset, and reset, and reset. And that's why it's very important to build through the draft. So while I do believe it makes sense for both teams, realistically, I wouldn't make that deal. Because again, like I just said, games are won down in the trenches, right? A GM's lifeline is their draft capital. And while Justin Fields may be the better player, quarterback and then Jamie Garoppolo it doesn't even matter because you need an offensive line to begin with so I'm just saying all right so that's my thoughts on that please drop your comments in the comments section below I like to respond to all my comments as everyone's part of the Beast Rider family where social media engagement is encouraged so please go ahead and do that I'll be back in a jiffy in a jiffy I never use that term I'll be back in a jiffy no I'll be back posting another podcast episode as we are bringing on a new guest so stay tuned for that thank you for tuning in have a good day beast rider out